the mathematicians allege that God created neutrons to keep positively charged protons from repelling each other, the nucleus would otherwise blow apart. However, deuterium and tritium are two isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton and no neutrons. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron. And tritium has one proton and two neutrons. If the purpose of neutrons is to keep protons apart, why did God put neutrons in these two hydrogen isotopes? Clearly the quantum mathematician's prediction didn't come true. There should be no reason for an atom to have more protons than neutrons. The periodic table of the elements says something different. Ever heavier elements have more neutrons than protons. For instance, sodium has 11 protons and 12 neutrons, rubidium 37 and 48, and cesium has 55 and 78. That's now two predictions of the religion of mathematics which didn't come true. More intriguing, as we move from left to right on the periodic table, although the atoms have more protons and neutrons, they occupy smaller volumes. For example, sodium has 23 protons and neutrons and has been measured to have a radius of 180 picometers. Chlorine has 35 protons and neutrons but measures about half as much, 100 picometers. The quantum mathematicians explain this trend mathematically, saying that the radius of an atom is a function of nuclear charge. The higher the positive charge in the nucleus, the closer it will attract the negative electrons buzzing around it. However, potassium has 39 protons and neutrons and measures more than twice that of chlorine. That's now a third prediction of mathematics that didn't come true. Let's propose two theories under the rope hypothesis to address these questions. Keep in mind what we are trying to answer here. We are trying to answer two questions. Why do heavier elements in the periodic table have more neutrons? And why does atomic radius decrease from left to right despite that the elements have more protons and neutrons? Under the rope model of light and the thread version of the atom, an electron is a balloon that encapsulates the proton star. In contrast, a neutron is a crossroads of electromagnetic ropes extending from all atoms to all others. Heavier elements have balloons encapsulating smaller electron balloons and neutrons. It is inside stars like our sun where chemical elements are manufactured. There, countless atoms and neutrons are packed closely together. As atoms are compressed, the electron shells merge and form bigger balloons. These larger volumes necessarily incorporate more neutrons. For instance, when the electron shell of hydrogen expands, it incorporates an adjacent neutron and becomes deuterium. If the shell expands again, it now incorporates a second neutron and becomes tritium. The reason tritium is unstable and radioactive is that the balloon is stretched to the limit. It wishes nothing better than to contract to a lower energy level, to a more manageable size by expelling a neutron. Similarly, uranium is radioactive and unstable because it has 92 protons and 146 neutrons, 238 nucleides compressed into a volume no larger than sodium, which only has 23. Therefore, to invoke the favorite word of mathematics again, the rope hypothesis predicts that larger electron shell volumes will necessarily incorporate more neutrons. The larger the electron balloon, the more neutrons it can incorporate within this larger volume. And the more the outer shell is stretched, the more unstable and radioactive an atom will tend to be. It will attempt to expel nucleides. In order to understand why atoms are smaller as we move from left to right on the periodic table, let's first look at an analogy. We have a box with four sets of balloons, representing orbitals of a given chemical element. If we squeeze a fifth atom in the box, each atom will occupy a smaller volume. The amount of matter will be the same, but each atom will be denser. This mechanism explains how an atom shrinks but not why an atom of sodium is larger than an atom of chlorine. 
In order for the analogy to succeed, the box itself must also contract. A star is a differentiated object. Heavier chemical elements, those with more protons and neutrons, are manufactured closer to the center of a star where the pressures are increasingly greater. Not only is a given layer compressed from the sides, but also from the layers mounted on top of it. Under thread theory, it is this increasing pressure as we go deeper into a star that accounts for the smaller sizes of heavier elements. To recap, the larger an electron balloon, the more neutrons it will encapsulate and the more unstable and radioactive a chemical element will tend to be as the membrane approaches its stretching limit. The star later compresses an atom like our shrinking box, squeezing the atoms to their final sizes. Heavier chemical elements, those with more neutrons and protons, are manufactured at a deeper level where the pressures in a star are greater. Thus, despite having fewer protons and neutrons, sodium, which is created farther from the center, has a greater volume than chlorine, which is produced at a deeper level where the pressures are greater. The purpose of the neutron is not to keep positive proton marbles apart, but is rather a direct function of the radius of an atom. For decades, the mathematicians have been investigating the cosmic microwave background radiation. They allege that space is filled with particles they call photons. According to the religion of mathematics, when God created the universe 13 billion years ago, he unleashed an evil spirit the mathematicians call radiation, and which now pervades and haunts every region of space. In the religion of mathematics, space itself is a medium a bag or an ocean of sorts that is encapsulated and contoured by who knows what. The universe is therefore expanding. Yesterday it was smaller than it is today. Space, the mathematicians claim, is sizzling with supernatural and surrealistic activity. Mathematics holds that the vacuum is made of particles which constantly come into and out of existence. The members of this religion even claim that they have experiments to back their words. Thread theory certainly regards the universe as an amazing place, but Mother Nature does not run her shop with black magic. Again, to invoke the favorite word of mathematics, the rope hypothesis predicts the cosmic microwave background radiation. All the ropes extending to atoms through neutrons fill the regions between planets, stars, and gases. It is this so-called background radiation that our technology now allows us to detect. Thus, because of their irrational insistence on particles, the mathematicians erroneously concluded that the gravity probe B gyroscopes drag space itself around. When in fact it is this vibrating mesh of ropes and threads which forms the background, the mathematical world confuses with space. Regarding the mysterious appearance and disappearance of particles that allegedly comprise the vacuum, the rope hypothesis proposes a simpler and more down-to-earth explanation. The scholars are describing what is known as beta and inverse beta decay. The ability for a neutron to spontaneously convert into a proton while expelling an electron from the nucleus and vice versa. To become a proton, remember a, neut a neutron has neutral charge. So what it does is it, it emits an electron. And I know you're saying, Sal, you know, that's crazy. I didn't even know neutrons had electrons in them and all of that. And, and I agree with you. It is crazy. And, and one day we'll study all of, all of what exists inside of the nucleus. But let's just say that they, it can emit an, a, a, an electron. And, and by emitting an electron, instead of being neutral, now it turns into a proton. And so this is called beta decay. What is physically happening when an atom converts to a neutron or a neutron to an atom? How does the fact that an atom loses its electron bead make it lose charge and transforms the proton into a neutral neutron? Under the thread model of the atom, a neutron merely has to release one of the threads of each rope that comprises it. The resulting architecture is an atom. 
The release threads now form a shell that encompasses the proton star and both begin to quantum jump and to generate charge. Conversely, the threads comprising the electron shell of an atom can spontaneously merge with the threads comprising the proton star and form a rope. The atom has disappeared. In its place, we have a convergence of ropes, each of which continues onward to some atom as if nothing. The seeming appearance and disappearance of matter from the nothingness of space is simply the spontaneous conversion of atoms into neutrons and neutrons back into atoms. The particle model proposed by the religion of quantum mechanics has no chance in science. There are no quarks, neutrinos, electrons, muons, photons, gluons, gravitons, solitons, chronons, phonons, or any of the other hundreds of particles invented by the mathematicians to plug holes in their irrational explanations. Such a proposal would nevertheless make William of Ockham very angry. The alleged traces of particles that the mathematicians see in their bubble and cloud chambers, and which they've never filmed in the making, are actually electromagnetic ropes and threads which they induced to come into view when they shook the cosmic web, the ropes and threads that bind every atom in the universe. In Mother Nature's simple and symmetric universe, there are only atoms interconnected by electromagnetic ropes which intersect at neutrons. <laughs>